So, um, I am not a developer. I just want to point that out to everyone. And so this session is for developers, it's for coders, it's for people who maybe historically their job role hasn't allowed them the experience to get back to Drupal. Or you just don't know how to do it. You know, so this is, and it's sort of a fire hose. Um, I go and I talk about why we should do it and different things that we can do besides the issue queue, but then I go into a demo of the issue queue. And then I talk about the GitLab process, which the issue queue is sort of phasing out and being antiquated, but it'll be another 18 months to two years before the GitLab process. So if we have time, the Drupal Association made me a little short video to kind of go over the GitLab process too. So, um, and what I try to do is some parts of giving back to the issue queue are a little bit more complex. Um, but I try to do it in a way that's like looks really easy. That way you can go back and what I do is I put notes up later that have exactly the steps to do it. But I, but I go through it like this is how easy it is. You know, once you learn it, it only takes 10 minutes, you know, that kind of thing. So it'll feel like a fire hose, but it's really easy, okay? So, um, who am I? Well, um, I'm gonna sit down because it's really low. Um, my name's Amy June, and it's titled Camel Case, so it's one word. Um, my preferred pronouns are she and, and her. Um, I'm an open source community ambassador for Campus Studios. And what does that mean? Well, that means I help promote our favorite CMSs. I do WordPress and Laravel and Drupal. Um, you know, give love to everybody. Um, so I work 40 hours a week giving back to the community, and so one of the things I do is I help with the outreach of how to do it and do trainings and that sort of thing. And then if anyone has questions, like I am a good resource to ping in the Drupal Slack channel, like if you're having a hard time doing something, I have plenty of time to help folks contribute back. So um, let's see. Um, I also organize Ally Talks, which is an online, I don't think that's up on the slide, it's an online virtual meetup that we have every month where we talk about all things accessibility, and that's kind of fun. Um, I'm a mom. I, in my previous life, have been a hospice nurse, so I have a, like a little bit of a range of activities. Um, I like reading comics, I like geocaching, I like mushroom hunting, and I really like their cool Volkswagens. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> Canopy Studios, they sponsor my time, um, and they're an open source website agency. They do everything from strategy, design, development, and support, so we do the whole gamut of things. Um, and we try to work on websites that are open source that make an impact, like lots of higher ed and nonprofit and that kind of thing, so government. Um, who are you guys? So who's a project manager? Okay, um, agency owner? Anybody? Coder? Okay, developers, yeah. Um, who's in sales? Designers? Okay, well, that's okay. Um, so, anyone can get back to Drupal. Um, all skill levels, all job roles, um, all you really need in, is like a passion to give back. You know, that altruistic sense of it's a project we use and we should move it forward, you know. So, um, the more tailored the Drupal project is, the easier it is to sell to future developers and the easier it is to sell to our clients. You know, the, 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 the forward-facing Drupal project is really important when we go to sell Drupal as their CMS, right? So, um, what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about why we should contribute. I'm not going to give you guilt trips, but we should just do it because that's the right thing to do. Um, the benefits of contributing, we're going to talk about how to start contributing, not just the issue queue, but other things that we can do as people in the community that don't involve code. Um, how do we keep the contributors we already have? Because we do face contributor burnout. Um, and how do we foster new contributors? And then last, we'll do a demo where I go over anatomy of an issue. And then if there's time, because it is sort of a fire hose, and I'd rather take a little bit more time and do a demo. So if there's time, we'll watch that little short GitLab video. And GitLab is basically the new tooling system which sort of parallels GitHub, if you have a GitHub workflow where there's pull requests and inline code editing and that kind of thing. So, so why do we contribute? So 
Not everyone who works on the Drupal project is a senior developer. Uh, there's all kinds of smaller tasks that help people increase their confidence and gain experience, which in turn leads to more contributions. The more you contribute, the more you accidentally learn how to code, because that's how I kind of learned how to code, was just the more things I was in um, it helped. Um, the code is really important, but um, so are all the other parts. Contributing back to Drupal helps us all become better developers. A more polished Drupal leads to a better overall experience, like I said. Um, and open source contributions have no explicit value. You know, there's no hard-earned cash that comes along with contributing. Um, however, the implicit value is the important part, right? Um, we get paid in knowledge. The more you contribute, the more you learn. And you know, we've all heard this, code, come for the code, stay for the community. And the community is a lot of fun. I've worked in a couple of different CMS projects now in Drupal, which is my favorite. The people are so <laughs> nice, you know? They're so nice in the issue queue. Everyone wants to help everyone out, you know? So um, the benefits of contributing. So, you know, it just feels good, right? It just feels good to get back to things. Um, we move the Drupal project closer to perfection. So that's another thing, you know, when we have that forward-facing project, our clients are looking at it. And other developers from other languages are coming in and they're evaluating our code. So the more polished our code is, and the UI and the documentation, the more we're drawing new contributors to Drupal. You know, we don't want the contributors to look at our PHP and see old coding standards or anything like that. We really want to refine our project so we're, like I said, you got to keep it moving forward to draw the, the clients and the developers. So, um, why individuals give back? Um, again, why not, right? I know in our millions of hours of free time. Um, but it helps build our resume. Um, devs and others who give back to the community can build up a reputation. You know, you work in the community, people know that you help out and people will solicit you or people will ask for your help. Um, your Drupal.org profile is populated. That's something that you can use on a job resume. You know, you can, like, sometimes a Drupal shop will look at how much you contribute back, and that populates on your Drupal.org resume. Um, people who contribute back are probably okay with others reviewing their code, you know, so it shows that you're a team player. Um, creating issues and forks sort of parallels, working on tickets and creating branches. So even if you're new to programming, it's something, it's a skill that you learn, especially when we move to that GitLab process, you're learning how to do pull requests and things like that. Um, and then contributing back to open source shows that a developer is willing and able to work on a team too. It's hard to work on a team, you know, so. Yeah. Um, why Drupal shops should give back. Again, why not? It's the right thing to do. Um, companies consume Drupal, it's free, so it's a free resource, so this is the guilt part. They should be giving back. Um, they should appreciate the value of helping and you know, also appreciating others. Uh, let's see. In the tech industry, using and contributing to open soft source software can be seen as um, a part of global citizenship, maybe. Um, it show, it's sort of your firm's social responsibility to give back. Uh, it's fun and rewarding, and some of the smartest people work in the community, so it helps draw, draw talent, talent. Because not only when you give back to Drupal, if you're working for a company, if you attribute your company's time, their Drupal.org profile page gets populated. And sometimes when you're looking for a job, that might be something that's important to you. So you can go to your, that company's Drupal.org profile and see how they contribute, what projects they maintain, that kind of thing. So how do we start contributing? I had a fortune cookie one time about 12 years ago that said, begin, the rest is easy. Okay. <laughs> and that can like be in so many parts of your life, right? The hardest step is that first one. Um, so there's all kinds of different ways you can contribute back to the issue queue, or contribute back besides the issue queue. Um, everyone always says, you know, just start with documentation, but 
how can I contribute if I don't know what I'm doing? Well, you're the perfect person to help with documentation because if there's steps missing, you'll find those steps. And you can ping the maintainer and be like, hey, but how do I use this? And they'll help you write the documentation. So as a beginner, I think documentation is a great way to give back to Drupal. Um, you know something cool? You can share it at a local meetup or do a training at a camp. Um, you can write external documentation guides for different projects. You can work in translations. Um, they're working on the umami theme and they're looking to translate that into Spanish right now. So if you know Spanish, you can help translate the umami theme or distribution, I guess it's called. Um, you can contribute back by writing your own themes and modules and you can promote the platform. And the ways to contribute in the issue queue. There's reporting issues, there's updating issues, there's providing feedback, there's testing patches, there's breaking code, um, there's triage. And how do we keep the contributors we already have? How do we fight contributor burnout? Well, why do contributors burn out? Well, there's a whole work-life balance. You know, we're working 40 hours a week sometimes in our job, and the only time to give back is after those 40 hours. So um, there's the lack of recognition that comes along sometimes with helping out. Um, there's a lack of employer incentives sometimes. So they're not paying you the two hours a week community time. They're not um, sending you to Drupal camps. They're, um, you know, for any number of reasons, maybe that's just not in their, in their growth path is to help contribute back to Drupal. And then um, there's a huge learning curve between releases for Drupal, so that makes it hard for people to give back. How can we fight burnout? Well, let's see. You've been doing it for a while, it's time to shift roles. Maybe move out of the issue queue and start leadership. Maintain projects, help with theming, um, run initiatives. Uh, do the tag team at DrupalCon. You know, there's ways to move out and like sort of spice up your life a little bit and just sort of, and with that, when you step down and you give that leadership role to someone else and it's sort of this like fluid project. And again, mentoring, speaking at camps, that sort of thing. And then how do we foster new people? We mentor them. We do community outreach. We get our high school students to be into Drupal. We help, we help high schoolers build apps like D&D character sheets and trick them into learning Drupal, right? And we mentor them along the process. Or so. middle school kids too, right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Everyone's on their phone. Hey, Drupal can be an app. They're doing headless Drupal, you know? So a lot of it is mentoring and community outreach. Okay. So now we're going to kind of shift goal, shift gears a little bit and talk about the issue queue because that's why we're all here. How do we get back to the issue queue? Are you ready? Okay. So finding an issue. This can be, as a beginner, a challenging first step. It's, it's um, the issue queue can be sort of daunting. Um, you can start with issue triage. You can make sure that that issue is still relevant. You can look in there and see, oh, <laughs> this issue is porting Drupal 8 module to Drupal 6. Well, that's not relevant. You can, you can make a comment, you can flag a maintainer, you can close the issue. Um, there's tagging an issue. That means, like, say it's an accessibility issue, you can tag it with the accessibility tag. If it's a theming issue, you theme it with tagging, and that will help people who are doing advanced searching because they want to work on a specific project. There's testing and reviewing code. You don't have to know how to write a patch to test and review it. Um, and then you can apply patches and just test to see if the patch applies. So all sorts of things you can do without actually writing a patch. And how do you choose what to work on? Well, one of those tags is novice, so you can uh, choose based on your skill ability, tagging, interests, you can work on an area of your interest. And another thing to look at is, is the issue actively maintained? So you can see here that this issue, August 31st of 2018, that's, that's pretty maintained. But you know, you might not necessarily want to jump into your first project being an issue from 2015 and no one's been, you know, the issue queue was full of old 
old issues and bugs and the maintainers aren't just, they aren't fi fixing them. So working on an actively maintained project is, is, is a good way to start. Issues to avoid. Of course, issues with over 100 comments. That means there's a lot of discussion, maybe, and there's differing opinions, and it's been re-rolled a couple of times. And as a beginner, maybe that's not the best issue to jump in on. Um, issues that have changed from review, needs work, RTPC, needs work, I don't know, you know, those might not be the best issues to start working on either. Um, projects with lots of open issues. That's sort of one of those signs that the maintainer maybe isn't actively involved. That's not the only, that, that might not be what it is, but as a beginner, like I said, sometimes just working on a project that's pretty maintained, it's got one or two or maybe 20 in the queue. Um, you don't want to work in a project that multiple <laughs> issues say they won't fix them. Because that's some, maybe the module maintainer is a little reluctant to, you know, to fix those things. So sometimes that isn't great for beginners. Um, you got to understand that it might take a couple iterations um, of working in the, in the project, in, the, in that particular issue, to get the code the way the maintainers want. So you have to like try not to get down on yourself. Just be happy and grateful that you're getting your code reviewed when that happens. Because um, positive attitude like, just goes so far in Drupal. And if you show enthusiasm to learn the code base and work with the maintainers and help others and add value, then others will see that and they'll give you the benefit of the doubt when you're working in the issue queue. And when I was first working in it, I was, oh, I, it's a, a little bit of imposter syndrome, but I clarified that I'm a beginner. I'm open to suggestions, but I found this bug sort of thing and here's what I propose. So sometimes indicating that you're open to suggestions is a really, um, a really good thing to do in the issue queue. Um, you can report issues. You don't have to know how to fix the problem to report an issue. <clears throat> you don't have to be a developer. to. You, you, you don't have to do a lot of things to report an issue, but reporting an issue is a good thing because it flags that the module needs work. You know, and um, sometimes if you work, if you just report the issue and monitor it, because when you report an issue, every time someone comments on, on it, unless you unfollow it, you'll get an email, like with the feedback. So you can learn how the, those people fix that issue that you reported, just for the knowledge base. And what kinds of issues are worth reporting? Anybody? <laughs> All of them. <laughs> That's right. So client-facing errors and bugs are just as important as the code. Um, making sure the project looks good to future um, clients and users ensures the future of the project. I mentioned this before. And you know, all of them. UI errors, documentation, accessibility bugs. And again, you don't have to know how to fix it to report it. A good thing to do if you find an issue is to search the queue first to see if the issue already exists. Um, if it doesn't exist, you know, um, reporting the bugs is important because if we don't, um, if we don't report the bugs or make notes on how to reproduce them, like say say the issue already exists but there isn't a lot of notes on it, you can go in there and edit the summary or add steps to reproduce and help that issue like be a little bit more valuable to somebody else. Um, you, um, especially steps to reproduce. That's a, that's, that's a good thing to do if that's not already in the issue and you, and you found it because you just recently, it's in your brain, right? And that helps someone who's reviewing the code later to test it if they know exactly how to break it in the first place. Um, anatomy of an issue. So when we create an issue, and we'll go over creating an issue, there's certain things that you should um, make sure that you address. Um, the category, that, and I'm gonna show you an example page of it. Um, is it a bug report? Is it a feature request? Is it support? Is it documentation? Um, how important is it? What's the priority? Is it critical? Is it a, is it a game changer? Is it a, a blocker? Um, is it just like a little typo? Well, not just a typo. There's no such thing as just a typo. But if it's something small, you know, in the documentation, you mark it minor. 
Um, the status is important. Is it active? Does the does the issue need work? Um, did you review it? That's RTBC, which is reviewed and tested by the community. You tested the patch. You saw that it worked. Um, is it fixed? The version of the module or project that you're using is important to indicate because not all bugs go from version to version. The component that varies on the project, what, what metadata is provided. It could be UI, it could be documentation, it could be code, it could be the sub-modules, it could be tests, and then the tags. You know, if you're reporting an issue and you, you know that you can tag it, that's a pretty handy place to do it. So this is the issue. This is the metadata. So the title, we want a succinct and clear title. We don't want a long one because that, that might be confusing. Um, here's the category, you know, is it a bug report? Priority, the status. Usually when you report an issue, you just leave it as active when you first report an issue. We have the version number. And the component changes from project to project. That's something the maintainer can put in there. You can choose which, which components to put in there. And the assigned button, now that depends on who you talk to. I recently <coughs> heard that if it's a core issue, don't assign it to yourself. They'll assign, the core maintainers will assign it. But what I do for contributed modules is if I know I'm gonna, I reported the issue and I know how to fix it, I'll assign it to myself and that alerts someone that I'm gonna work on it in the next day. But say you got distracted and something happened and a project of yours blew up, be considerate and change that back to unassigned unless, and make a comment saying, oh, I, I don't have time to work on this. Or maybe make a comment that you do have time because we don't want to double our efforts and have two people working on the same thing at the same time. So communication is key. And then here's the here's like some examples of what you can do for issue tags. You know, what I do is when I come to a camp and I'm doing a sprint, I'll tag it with a with a camp. So if we're all working on something together, we can pull up issues. So um, was that the same thing? Yes. Okay anatomy of an issue again. So we're going to talk a little bit about a browser extension called Dreditor. I'm just going to mention it now, but I am going to show it and I am going to talk about it more in a minute. What it does is it adds some buttons in the issue queue when you have it enabled on your browser. And one of the things it does is when you create a summary, it will in inject these headings. And so you can fill out the problem and motivation and what will happen is you will want to take, do steps to reproduce the ex expected results, the, um, the actual results, and then you know proposed resolution, remaining tasks, UI. So what happens is when you hit the button that says enter template, it gives you this information and then you just go in and you fill a lot of these out. And a lot of times, I have to admit, I put not applicable because a lot of these, you know, I'm not making any interface changes, I'm not changing the API, I'm not doing any data modeling, you know. But it's a good, especially if you're working in core, they sort of like you to do this and it reminds you of the things that people might need to have when they reproduce the work on the issue. You know, platinum. It's all, you know, the better, the more information you give people, the easier it is to, to work on a project. So I'm going to talk about writing a patch. Writing a patch is pretty easy. There's only a few steps. We download the repo. We fork it and create a new branch. We make changes. We compare the changes and we make the patch from the comparison and then we ship it back up to triple.org and make a comment. Now that's a really simple way of looking at it, but those are actually the only steps it takes to create a patch. Reviewing an issue. Reviewing an issue is a great place to get started in the issue queue because you don't have to know code to test a patch. You don't have to have a local environment to test a patch. There's a project called Simply Test Me that creates and spins up sites online for you where you can, there's a, there's a user interface that allows you to have certain like features like what version of the module are you working on? Where, what's the patch's URL? And I'll show that too. Um, you can just test it locally in your Git repo to see if it applies. You know, especially for documentation, you don't need to spin up a Drupal site to test documentation, but we want to know that the patch applies. Um, 
you provide useful information, you attach screenshots, you update the status. So again, it's, it comes back to like, the more information the next person has, the better. So, reviewed and tested by the community, and then we call that RTD. And this is when you're done with a patch and you've decided, you know, it applies and it's done its job. So we mark it RTBC. And this is one of those things where we just change the status. We don't need to change any of this other stuff except for maybe, you know, if we had assigned it to ourselves. So the status goes from active and then someone puts up something so it needs review. And then it could go back to needs work because if maybe the patch didn't apply or there's there's some coding standard. But then once you've tested it, you mark it RTBC. And then the rest of the stuff is mostly for the maintainers. But so that's sort of the, the workflow. And it can, it can go back and forth a few times, you know, especially when you're a beginner, don't, don't feel overwhelmed and don't feel intimidated if someone marks your patch needs work. You just go in there and you fix it. You ask for help. You know, you just make sure that you have the information you need to make that new patch. And like I said, lots of project maintainers or people online, if you have issues, they'll help you work through those, you know, and like help you create an inner diff which compares the two patches you made. You know, there's all kinds of things that go along with it that seem hard, but once you ask people questions, especially in Drupal Slack, there's a few channels. There's like a contributed channel, there's a mentoring channel, um, there's a general channel where most people are real recept receptive to, you know, um, beginners. Because we all, want, we all want to move the project forward and, you know, getting the new blood in there really helps. Um, so, I want to talk about Dreaditor when we're testing patches. If we didn't have this Dreaditor extension, looking at a patch can be kind of weird because it's just this white file and there's pluses and minuses and you can't tell what changed. So, Dreaditor injects this review button and what happens with the review button is it opens up the UI and I'll show a picture of that. It also gives you a simply test me button, and I'll show this. The simply test me button, you click on that, it takes you to the simply, simply test me user interface, and it populates it with your issue information. So it's really handy. And this is when you click on the review button, this is what pops up. So instead of looking at this white page with a bunch of pluses and minuses and you can't tell what changed, what it does for you is it tells you what lines were taken out and how they were changed, corresponding line numbers. When you click on a line and you want to make a comment, this window opens up and it pastes your code markup and you make a comment, hit save and hit paste and that comment you made along with that code snippet will show up in the comment window. So say you don't like the way they did whatever. I don't do code, so I can't tell you if this is right, okay? But say, you know, maybe they didn't do a code comment right. You would click on it, make your comment, and then it shows up in your, in your, in your issue, or in, your, in the next comment window, and then you would mark it needs review. Okay, so we're gonna do a live demo. We're going to look at the issue queue. We're going to look at issue that I've already planned out. We're going to spin up a review on Simply Test Me. Then we're going to go into a project and we're going to find a mistake in the project. We're going to make a patch and we'll put it up on Drupal.org. So we're going to do sort of that whole process. Um, let's see. As far as the patching process, we'll find a problem. We're going to download the repo onto our machine. We're going to file an issue, so we'll go through like the steps of filing an issue. We're going to create a new branch on our machine. I'm going to make changes. I'm going to create a patch, and I'm going to upload that patch to Drupal.org. And like I said, these are the steps. It's pretty easy. There's a couple of like command line things here and there, but it's really easy. So what we're going to do is I'm going to navigate to my Drupal.org profile, and I'll kind of show you this. Because with my Drupal.org profile, what I have is a dashboard. So when I go to my dashboard, you can configure your dashboard to have certain blocks. So I've configured my dashboard with things that I use every day. I have security updates because I do some security stuff. I have my contributor links. I have a core link. I have a Drupal block, a planet, Drupal planet block. And then I have a block where it's all the issues I work on, so what I can do is I can look at this, because 
you get an email for each issue you've commented on. And sometimes if you're in the issue queue a lot, you can wake up in the morning and there'll be like 50 emails. And I have to admit, I ignore those. So I just go here and I can see what was done the night before and like if I want to work on that project again. But most importantly, there's this contributor links. And in here, what's nice is there's a novice button. So you can click on this and it will take you to the, all of the issues that were mar marked novice in the issue queue. So let's talk about the way this looks. Okay, the color's a little funky, but they're color-coded. So when they need work, they're red. If it needs review, they're yellow. If they've been reviewed and tested to, by the community, they turn green. So this is a good thing. Say you're like, oh, I'm just gonna look at patches today and review them. You can just go to these yellow ones. And you can see here when the last comment was made, how many comments were made and like how many of them are new. You can see what version you're working on. Um, this is the project. So you, know, you can see that Drupal core is specified versus the, the contributed projects. So that's sort of the anatomy of the issue queue. And let's see, up here you can change this. So you can delete this. And what happens is, let's see, now you're going to have every issue. So again, those tags that we talked about, you know, uh, accessibility, user interface, that kind of thing, this is where you would put that in to sort of uh, test where it out. Where did you put novice again? What's that? Where did you put novice in? Novice, it's right here. Oh, you just put it as a tag? Yeah. Okay. Um, and what I do, going back to like my dashboard, I have it set up to hit novice issues. So, um, so Let's people see. actually tag the issues. Yep. Novice issues. Mm -hmm. And th what that does too is it helps engage people because some people will be like, well, especially some developers just don't want to work on documentation, but they're welcome to have someone else do it, and they know that's a good beginner task. Or as we're doing issue triage, we can like make sure that when we're doing uh, collaboration days and things like that, we can have a set of issues kind of pulled aside for people who, who might not be able to, you know, like review code in 16 different files, you know, so. Um, let's see what else. Oh, Dreaditor. Again, it's a Chrome extension. Um, I think Mark Carver says it's like, the prediction is cloudy with a chance of deprecation. So it's sort of one of those things. Sometimes you can't even find it. And I think it's just for Chrome right now. So I don't know how many of you aren't Google users, but I think right now. But sometimes it's for Safari. It depends on, you know, I don't know why I can't find it sometimes and sometimes I can't. So, but that's just, all it does is, Dreaditor stands for Drupal Editor. That's its only function, is helping people out in the issue queue and giving those buttons, so. Okay, so what I did was, I found us an issue already, because that makes it easier. So what I did was I went into the issue queue, and I found a novice issue called Coding Standards. I can't review it, I don't know. But um, what I did was I went into the issue queue, I came in here, I hit the review button, and this shows us what they changed in the file. So that's how we review it. I go back. I'm sorry, how'd you get here again? Okay, this is the issue. This is an issue that I picked. Okay. Like one of those ones in the in the queue, I just selected an issue and it's just one of the issues in this in this issue queue. Okay. So there's the review button, and what I what also Dreaditor does is it gives you that simply test me button. And what happens is it opens simply test me, which is a great project. It reduces the barrier to entry for so many people because you don't have to have a local environment. It gives you a place like not even in the issue queue, but say you want to review a module or project, but you don't want to spin up a whole site. You can enter the name of your project. You can do this drop down and select the version. You can open up an advanced feature. Oh, it's already open. But you can open up an advanced feature. You can add patches from their URL. You can add more projects. So this is not just for contributing back to Drupal. You can use it for testing modules. 
But that button, what it did was it pre-populated it for us. Here we have the project name, the machine name. It gave us the version that they wanted to patch. And what it did was it gave us the patches URL. So now all we have to do is launch the sandbox. So that's a great, it just does it all for you, right? So you launch the sandbox. And sometimes it takes a while, it'll queue up. So what I did was I already launched it, and what will happen is it will kind of go through this bar and kind of hang out for a while, and it depends on like how fast your internet connection is. Yep. Does it automatically set you up as user one? Yep. yep, yep. So what happens, I already spun it up, is it opens a website for you, right? It, there's an instance, and you click the login button. Well, also, when it spins up, it confirms that the patch applies. So we know that this, this patch will apply. So we've already tested that. We know that the patch applies. And normally, um, I don't know if I can get to Wait, this. So if the patch did fail to apply, this wouldn't like, even spin up. Right, it'll, it'll show you in the UI up here. If the patch fails to apply, where is it? Right here, it'll pop up saying there was an error. Okay. But sometimes that's, sometimes it's a false negative. So I don't know why sometimes it doesn't work and it does, but usually if it does work, it does work, you know, that kind of thing. And so what I do is sometimes if it doesn't apply and I know that there's an issue, I'll apply it locally and then I'll kind of kind of know. But that's more complicated than, than we need to talk to, about. To, um do that locally, you have to have your own environment set up. No, you don't, not necessarily. Not if you're only testing to see if it applies. Oh. What you can do is you can just go into that get repo, apply it, and your command line will tell you whether or not it applied. Okay. But if you wanted to test it, you would have to have that local environment. But if it was a UI issue or, or you know, adding some content and stuff like that. So that's basically the dreaded or function, you know, spinning up um, simply test me. So now, I know that it passed, right? I know that the patch applied. So I can go back to that original issue. I would go in here, but I don't code, so I'm not gonna comment on this. If I thought the code looked good, what I would do is I would come down, and I would change the status to RTBC because I reviewed and tested it. I'd make a useful comment, and what I'd say is, I tested the patch using Simply Test Me. It applied, or the patch applied locally. I would say what I looked at, like I navigated to this, 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 and this, and this change was there. So I indicate what I tested and how I can determine whether or not it passed. It's a coding standards, like I said. I don't know how to review it, but I might, as a beginner, go in here and say the patch applied, but not change the status. So at least like the, the next person knows that the patch applied. So there's that part of it. So I'm gonna close this out and we'll talk about an issue I already found. So what happened here was I had to, don't ask me why, look at this module, the Taiwan address field. And what I do to evaluate a project is this is the project page. This is where it gives you all the information about the project or where it should give you information on the project. So when I evaluate a project, I kind of scroll down here, and there's a place where you can browse the code repository before you put it on your machine. So I was clicking on this, and I was looking, and I went to the tree, which is the file structure, and I opened up the README to see what the, how do I use this module, right? Isn't that where we look to see if we know where to use it? And I looked at it and I was going through some stuff and I'm like, oh, um, let's see, Drupal 8. So I want to read the README in the Drupal 8 file. And I'm scrolling down and I noticed this is a Drupal 8 module. I noticed that this line is wrong. It leads to a Drupal 7 link. So let's fix it, right? Okay, so that's not the right link because that takes you like how to, 
how to install a contributed module using um, for Drupal 7, which doesn't talk about um, Composer. You know, it just is antiquated information for a Drupal 8 module. So now, I found a mistake. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go head back to that project page, right? Um, I'm gonna steal this address right here. Command C, and I have a handy dandy little shortcut that I do take me to the project page. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to this version control tab, and this opens up a page where I can download the repository. So here I am. It says, how do you set up this for the first time? And you can go through and read this. And like I said, this is kind of quick, but this is just a lightning demo. I'm gonna grab this get clone command. That's for seven. Um, I changed it, oh, okay, so show. Um, Oops, I hit a button. What happens when you download a repository is it downloads the whole thing and then you can change branches. But if you go in here and you hit eight and you hit show, when you open up, it will be on the right branch. So that's just sort of a convenience thing. But when you download the repository, it'll have all of the branches. It'll, if it has a Drupal 6, a Drupal 7, you'll just have to switch. So I'm gonna copy this command. That shortcut you used to get to the project page, is that, that D you put it on your DOP, computer? it's like your Google search. I put DOP, which stands for Drupal project for me, Drupal.org pro project, and that way if I hit the space, then it'll populate that Drupal oh, nice. thing, and that's, you can do that under custom search engines in your, in your. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, Learn so I do D-O-N for Jira Drupal node, forever. and. Okay. Yeah, because I'm lazy and I don't want to type that Jeez, out. I like to be lazy too. I'll, I'll show you later. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my terminal, which is on this page here. I am going to go to where I keep my modules. And I, you can keep yours wherever you want, right? So, I'm going to CD, which means change directory, and go into my Drupal folder. If I spell Drupal right, Drupal folder, and I keep them in a modules folder. And so now I do a PWD, which is present working directory, and it shows me where I am. I'm in my Drupal modules folder, and I'm going to paste that command in there. And what it did was it cloned the get repository, did all those things, and then now I'm going to CD into that new project, CD field address Taiwan. So now when I do PWD, you can see I'm in my um, Drupal module field address thing. Okay, so a handy trick is if you do open period, it will open where you are into your binder window. And then I just simply like drag my whole project into my text editor. And it's on this page. And I can see if I go into the readme, that indeed that is still the case, that that's wrong, right? Okay, so now what we're looking at is we're looking at the original branch in my text editor. So I'm gonna go back into my terminal and I'm going to change branches because what I wanna do is I wanna create a new branch to compare with that old branch. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to actually back up, I'm gonna create an issue on drupal.org. So. Sorry for jumping around. Okay, so we have this, we have this. We're going to navigate into that project page. And what we do is, on this side, there's an issue queue. And remember, we found an issue. We wanna make sure it doesn't already exist. So we're gonna go into the issue queue and we're gonna look, and sure enough, that issue doesn't exist. Those are the three issues that are there. So we're gonna go ahead and create a new issue. So, we create a new issue, we give it a field or title, we're going to say um, that the, oh, this one's wrong too, but let's just fix this one, um, but this one says it's Drupal 7 too, but we're going to say the installation link links to Drupal 7, so we're going to say incorrect install link for D8 branch. 
Succinct, says what it is, the project. What's the category? It's a task. It's very low priority, right? Um, the version, we want to work on Drupal 8. What's the component? Well, it's not code. It's not miscellaneous. It's not a user interface. It's documentation. And right now, I am going to take the next five minutes and work on this project, and I know I'm going to work on it. So this is the only time I'll assign it to myself. And right now, I'm going to label, I'm going to hit some tags just to, just to show you that we can do this. So it's a documentation, and it's a novice issue. So um, spell it right. It's a novice issue. I am going to write that um, in the README, the installation link leads to a Drupal 7 link. Um, and I'm going to say patch to follow, because I'm going to work on it right now. Succinct to the point. I'm going to come down here, and I'm going to hit save. And what happens when you create an issue on Drupal.org is it creates a unique node. And it gives you a node number. And this node number is important because that's how we name our patch and how we name our branches. So after you create an issue, you just sort of steal that node number. Like I said, each one is individual. So you can, um, let's see, yeah, we use it for naming our branch just for ease. And then we use it for when we create the name of our patches, because there's a certain naming convention for patches, which is the name of the project, and I'll do this when I, when I, when I create the patch. It's the name of the project, the issue, that unique node number, and the comment where you're going to post the patch. So we need that in a couple spaces. So I'm going to steal it. I'm going to go back. I'm going to go into my terminal, and I'm going to create a new branch. And you can do this using a get client. Like if you're not familiar with the command line, you can use something like source tree or smart get. Um, and so we create a new branch, which is get checkout dash B. And our unique node number. And I'm pretty sure that we're going to make that first comment because we just opened the issue. Do and we always have to create a new branch when we create a patch? Um, that is generally how Drupal.org wants you to do it, yes. Okay. So, so the first comment would be comment number two, because the first comment, well, the first comment is the issue, the summary of your issue, and the second comment is, like, actually the first comment. So I named it the unique node number and dash two, because I'm fairly sure we're going to be the first people to, to make a comment. So we switch to the new branch. So now when we open our text editor, we're on that branch. So I have the link already spawned up, a documentation link for installing Drupal 8 modules. So I'm going to grab that link. I'm going to go into my text editor. And I'm going to replace this link that goes to Drupal 7. And I'm going to paste my new link in there. I'm going to make sure it's formatted right, which is you hang indents. And there's an extra space. We don't want any extra spaces. So now I've changed the installation link. So I'm going to hit save. Now when I go to my terminal window and I do um, uh, get status, it shows me that I modified my readme. And those are the changes I want. Now all of these next steps are if you know how to use get in your command line, but you can use a get client for this stuff. So like I said, if you're not used to the command line, this can be daunting, but you can do all of these same things. And what I have in my slides when I give back is all of the steps, like how you can do it in the, in the get client. So anyway, so we, we modified that file, so we want to add it, which is get add period. And we're going to do another get status. If I spell it right. Okay, so we modified that, so we're going to commit it, which is a git commit 
dash M. And this is all stuff that you can do in your Get Client. And what I do is, I don't know how many of you are developers, but you know how we write good commit messages? This is no different. It's never going to show up anywhere, but why not just write a good commit message, right? So um, I don't want to do that. So I'm going to write um, changed install link, right? I might, if I wanted, like give a branch name, that kind of thing. So now we have committed our code. So now what we want to do is we want to make a patch. And what a patch is, is it's a diff between your original branch and your first branch. And I have the notes here. So it's a git diff between our original branch and our new branch. And the way we name it is um, this is for core. For a contributed module, it's the name of the project, what you did, the unique node number, and your uh, your comment number. So we're going to do a get diff between the 8.1 branch, our new branch, and name it this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cheat a little bit, and I'm going to copy and paste, because why not, right? So my new node number is that one. It's going to be comment number two. What's the importance of like the comment numbers? Because when we were viewing patches, we know which patch we're looking at, because there could be four or five patches. So if we know, when we make a comment, we say, Comment number two, and we associate with a patch, is just easier for reference more than anything because you could have an issue that might have six or seven patches. So it's just an easy way to reference which one. Okay, but you check if there's already patches? Okay. Well, if the issue already exists oh, okay. and you're adding a new patch, you would change that comment number. Like, say, you're going to comment on comment number six. So you ha still have that same unique node number because you're yeah. still working on that issue, but you're cur you're in a different comment. And it's just a way to like kind of tell where where it was in that cycle of the issue because it you know kind of iterates as it goes. So, um, and the name of the module is field address Taiwan. So I'm going to copy and paste that. Okay, so what I have is I'm going to do a get diff between that original branch, my new branch, the name of the module, what I did, I'm going to add a dash there, what I did was change the readme, the unique node number, and the comment number. And the reason why I iterate this is just for muscle memory, right, because, you know, it helps me too. So, and a dash. So, we're just going to copy and paste that command. We're going to go back into our terminal, and again, you can do this in your get client, and the get client is really easy because there's a button that says format patch, and it does all this for you once you have all those other steps done. So we'll apply that, and so now I've created a patch. So where is the patch? The patch is in my Drupal folder, my modules, in my field address Taiwan, and there's my patch, right there. So that's where it is, just for reference. So now, actually, I'm going to open it so we can look at it. And without the Dreaditor button, this is what it looks like. I've changed this line, and I've added that line. Those, that's the only thing I did. And I kind of like to do that for confirmation. There's nothing else we changed in this. So there should only be two changes. I did a little bit of reformatting, and that's why there's the second minus sign. So there's our patch. And we can close that and go back to our go back to our issue queue. And this is the exciting part. We can change this to needs review. I'm going to unassign myself. I'm going to comment that 
I uploaded a patch with the fix. Now this is pretty easy. Like if it was a more complicated patch, you would say exactly what you did, steps to replicate, that kind of thing. So you can come down here and choose your file, which is in my Drupal modules. What was the name of this project? Address. Field. Uh, field address. address. Okay, and there's my patch. And there's another <coughs> little preview window too. I don't know if you could know that, but if you select something, you can see your preview window just to make sure you have the right patch. Open it. If you want to test it, you can hit do not test. You can hit do you want to test it on the seventh branch? Do you want to test it on the eighth branch? We're going to upload it. And we're going to hit save. And now what happens is I've submitted a patch. It's up there on Drupal.org. Someone can review it. Someone can spin it up on Simply Test Me. And it's changed that to review. So now when I'm in the issue queue, it's going to be yellow and kind of flag that. So that's, I know it seems kind of like a long process, but once you get the muscle memory and like the documentation I can provide you, it's just like step by step. This is the command line. This is the next command. This is where you find this information. So, and like I said, what we can do is we can review it. There's the code. It looks good. You can spin it up on Simply Test Me. Make sure that the patch applies. Best practices, you don't review your own code, right? But I'm just right. showing you that that's what the next step would be. What's the, so, number, what's the number of the issue? The issue number is... Three zero three zero two nine two. You want me to repeat it? No, no. Okay. Sounds like he's going to review it. <laughs> <laughs> the so practice. anyway, that's basically it. Like I said, it's was sort of a fire hose, but um, I think it's pretty easy. And then we have like two minutes. That's perfect timing for the GitLab process. So I want to talk about that a little bit. Unless you have questions about this. Um, so, you do you want to, con want to continue recording? Or? Oh, I never stopped because I didn't mirror my screens. I okay. decided not to do that and okay. do the, okay. <laughs> sure. the craning the neck and not being able to see it. So, yeah. um, so why are we moving to GitLab? This is a good question. Um, the Drupal Association began the search um, a couple of years ago because one of the major reasons is we wanted to modernize our tooling. We're sort of falling behind in the development world by still patching. So we're adopting a developer workflow that most of other communities are using. Um, we're, we're preserving the unique elements of how we collaborate um, by keeping things like the review button and inline code editing and stuff like that. Um, we wanted to uh, sort of leverage an expert partner. And like I said, most of the reason is because most of the Drupal or the communities outside of Drupal are already doing this sort of inline um, editing and, and reviewing that way. So, and they were nice enough to make a little video and I think that it might be hard to hear because I think it just comes out of my screen, but it's real short. The Drupal Association is pleased to announce a partnership with GitLab to update the development tools on Drupal.org. We'll be rolling out this project in three phases. In the first phase, we'll be integrating GitLab's code viewing and code review tools into Drupal.org. As you can see here, you can view commits in the GitLab interface, scroll through the diff, and add comments. In the second phase, we'll be enabling merge requests in inline editing. In this example, you can see a new branch being created from the Drupal.org issue queues. This branch will be made available for collaboration in the GitLab interface by multiple Drupal contributors. In this first example, you can see a user navigating the branch to edit a file without having to clone a local copy. These edits can be committed back to the branch, and a comment will automatically be posted to the issue queue indicating the changes that were made. If another user wants to make changes, they could open another branch. But because Drupal prides itself on collaboration and single-threaded contribution, they can also work on the same branch to continue the work of the initial contributor. In this example, we now see a new user using the inline editor to make an additional edit or correction 
to the first user's contribution. Once those changes are committed, they're again published back to the issue queue. When one of the collaborators decides that they're ready for the changes to be merged, they can open a merge request from a button on the issue queue. This merge request is automatically generated in GitLab and available for review by other collaborators or by the project maintainer. Again, a comment is automatically posted to the issue queue to notify all followers that a merge request has been opened. The next step is for the maintainer to review the issue. When the maintainer signs in, they can view the merge request from the link next to the branch name in the issue, and when they decide the code is ready to be merged in, they can simply use the merge button in the GitLab interface. If necessary, they can revert the merge from the GitLab interface, or they can go to the issue to see that a final comment has been automatically posted, indicating that the changes have been merged. This completes the cycle of contribution using the Drupal.org and GitLab integration. In the third phase of this initiative, we'll be evaluating additional features, like GitLab's Web IDE, Contribution Graph, <coughs> and CI and CD pipelines. All these changes are coming soon, so keep an eye on the Drupal.org blog. Okay, so much easier process, you know, but it's a ways out, probably 18 months to, to two years. They're, they had a snag last week where they found a bug in the GitLab code base, and so they're going to have to sort of reevaluate what they're doing and how they're going to tool it. So, um, but like I said, like that patching process might seem a little daunting, but tomorrow if you come to collaboration day, if that's something you're interested in, I'm gonna be there and I can walk people through. It's a little bit easier when you're doing it side by side. And then I can, like I said, when I upload my slides, I'm gonna have the step-by-step -step instructions and also the step-by-step -step, step -step instructions how to do it on Simply Test Me and how to do it with a get client, which makes it a little bit easier, so. But once you have the process down, like we did that in less than 15 minutes, right? So maybe you don't know how to use the command line. Well, that's pretty easy. There's only three commands. There's like the get clone, the changing the directory, and the get dip. So if you look at it that way, you're not learning a whole new tooling. You're learning three commands. Um, you're learning how to pull it into your text editor and make the changes and make, you know, and compare the differences. That's basically what we did. We pulled it down, made another fork, compared the differences, made a patch that showed the differences and just shipped it back up. Reviewing documentation um, is a great way to start. And like I said, if you want to start contributing and you make comments, just ask for help. And usually people will be out there and they'll totally help you. On Thursdays, um, Damian McKenna, who's a like a community lead for Media Current, he has a media current contrib half hour. I think it's at noon on Thursdays Eastern time. Oh, maybe. maybe one o'clock because I'm on the West Coast so I have to like do the math. But he has a half hour where every week he talks about something new. He's got uh, an issues lab. So if you want to like work on an issue with him, he'll do an issue lab. He does testing labs if you want to learn how to write tests. He has a show me what you got lab. So he, I think there's five things that he sort of alternates through, but he he has something pulled up, ready to show, but he what really wants people to contribute and ask questions. So it's a very safe place to ask questions about what you should do next, how do you approach it, that sort of thing. And that's Media Contrib Half Hour with Damian McKenna. So What's his name again? Damian McKenna. Okay. How do we get links to his... I'll put those on my slides, okay. and then I'll probably put the slides up tomorrow because I'm going to drink beer tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Please do enjoy yourself. So, and like I said, like you can ping me. I'm Volkswagen Chick on like all the different channels, and I I have all the free time in the world to help people in the issue queue. Like even if you want like to like do the same thing side by side with me, I have a Zoom room that we can open and work on that together. I'm really about helping people give back. I worry that it seems daunting, but it's not, because I'm not a coder and I learned how to do it, so if I can learn how to do it, everyone can learn how to do it, so. <laughs> so. so you're going to upload this tomorrow? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are you on the Slack channel? Mm -hmm. Amy June. What, um, okay. what rooms are you in? Um, I don't know, I have most of them muted because it's really noisy. Um, I know I'm in the DD Diversity and Inclusion channel. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. I'm in there a lot, but um, I'm also, you can just ping me too, 
you know, direct message me. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.